two different ways of looking at it, a negative and a positive. So first of all, a negative response that we should have to the Magna Carta, or might be able to have to the Magna Carta, and then in light of that negative, those negative thoughts of mine, some positive thoughts, some kind of hope that we can still get out of Magna Carta. Um, and I'm interested very broadly in kind of everything I do in trying to use legal history, the history of the law, to better use and understand the law today. So that's what I'm talking about Magna Carta as a kind of broader point of. Okay? So you've probably, if you know, today or the past few weeks, seen some very strange and grand claims for Magna Carta. Just one to pick out this morning, I saw on Twitter um, people claiming that Magna Carta is the foundation moment for gay rights. Which is so nonsensical. <laughs> um, yeah, it was Peter Tatchell, the gay rights campaigner, was saying Magna Carta is the starting point for gay rights. Uh, and I'd encourage you, if you hear anyone say things like that, to ask them which chapter of Magna Carta they're specifically referring to. Be a good lawyer. Ask them for to cite something and explain where it comes from. Uh, but there's a few other things. The document we're celebrating today isn't called Magna Carta. It wasn't the Magna Carta that was signed in 1215. It only becomes the Magna Carta in 1217 when it's part paired up with the Forest Charter, the Small Charter. You can't have a big charter without a small charter. That's all it is, is the big charter that goes with the small charter. The document signed in 1215 was not called the Magna Carta. The document signed on this day in 1215, depending on disputes about calendars, was not the document that is held in the British Library, the four copies. That was worked out later. And it was filled out. So again, there's something odd to be interrogated about making this a day, making this Magna Carta day. It wasn't a piece of legislation. The concept of legislation didn't really exist then. Legislation, as we know it, starts most with proper legal historians, uh, rather than kind of uh, strange legal historians like me, would say that legal history starts, uh, legislation starts right near the end of the 13th century. What it was, was a charter, a coronation charter. This was a normal thing for new monarchs to issue a coronation charter. A set of promises of what they were going to do and their rule. It was unusual in that it was extracted during warfare. I'm going to come back to that, but it's just a charter, like so many charters. You can put it next to previous coronation charters and see a lot of similarity in the way that it's structured. Okay? It was repealed, like Ian said, very or did, never really came into force, but it was decisively got rid of uh, in a matter of weeks. In early August, was the Pope said, you don't have to follow this, and it was gone. It didn't bring peace. The baronial war, the civil war that was going on, kept going. Both sides of Magna Carta, it didn't, didn't stop it. King John died during the war. Um, it didn't, or it doesn't have any legal force. Can't really, you can't rely on anything in Magna Carta. Appeals get made to it, and I'm gonna, again, I'm going to come back to why we might appeal to Magna Carta. But it doesn't do anything. It guarantees freedom of the church, it guarantees freedom of the city of London, and even the nice words about trial by peers. Again, Ian sort of covered this. It just means this group of about 150 of the biggest landowners had their own court, and the king couldn't introduce his arbitrary justice. This is a specific contextual complaint about the king imposing himself on baronial disputes and demanding to be paid for the privilege of having the king's justice. Okay? That's just to exclude the king and to say that the barons should be able to judge their own disputes. That is a very different thing to what we would think of as the rule of law and threat, Rio and a trial and things like that. You can if you want an intelligent thing to say, claim the jury trial starts in 1215, but it doesn't start with Magna Carta. In 1215, the Church in England withdrew the authority for ministers of the Church to judge um, ordeals. That's where jury trial starts from. Once you can't get the Church to authorise your trial by ordeal, your trial by ordeal begins to fail, it begins to lose its legitimacy, jury trial begins to take its place. It's a slow and lengthy process, but in 1215, the ordeal was still the main way of telling whether someone was guilty or innocent. Okay? It disappears from historical record within about 200 years. The last major Middle Age use of Magna Carta was in the Peasants' Revolt in the middle of the 14th century. After that, it pretty much disappears from the record until we get to the English Civil War and a jurist called Edward Cook, spelled Coke. He writes about Magna Carta as being this principle of minimal powers of kings, of the king being limited by the law in the context of the English Civil War. Okay? That's the return of Magna Carta, the invention of the myth of Magna Carta. 
That's when Magna Carta takes off. It then gets used in the English Civil War, yes, it's used by Cook, it's also uh, used by the levelers, they refer to Magna Carta, it's used by Parliament, um, it gets taken up in the American War for Independence and in the American Declaration of Independence. Tom Paine famously calls for a Magna Carta of the colonies. It's used in the anti-slavery movement, it was used by the suffragettes, it was even used by the Occupy movement. Okay, so that's something. That's not nothing. So all that kind of, it's not this, it's not that, that's a, those are historical facts, but it does mean something. Just because something is a myth or a metaphor or a symbol doesn't mean it doesn't have some sort of force. So it's had this force, what is that force? Okay, so this is the positive. I've done the negative, this is the positive. Whilst Magna Carta itself, or whilst the thing signed in 1215, might not be a progressive document, might not have any legal force, essentially doesn't mean anything it can be useful for something, okay? Looking at it from, from a more positive perspective, trying to find something useful, it's a peace treaty, as I said, a failed peace treaty, but it's a peace treaty. It's a peace treaty in a war, okay? And this war is, like most wars, a class war. It was a war between the baronial class and the monarchy. It's a class war, it's a struggle over the different rights and powers and different freedoms that different classes have. When the war actually ends, so it gets reissued by Henry III or in his name uh, in 1216, it gets reissued again in 1217. The 1217, and this is where I'm going to focus as the start of somewhere where we could use Magna Carta positively or as a foundation for some kind of progressive political project. 1217, chapter 7. Chapter 7 of the 1215 document says stuff about how widows must be allowed to have their dowry and be supported. Chapter 7 in 1217 changes the language slightly and says that no widow will be denied their estovers or rights to the commons. Okay? 1217 is when the Forest Charter is, is written as well, which guarantees certain rights to the commons. This is the only document that has rights for peasants. The Forest Charter allows the peasantry to graze their animals or let their animals feed in the forest and it allows for the collecting of wood from the forest. Okay, this idea of the commons and of estovers, estovers is, again, taking from forests, from nature, the basic things you need to survive. Again, mostly it would be wood, it would be fire, fire wood being the most important hydrocarbon at the time, much like oil. Um, the gathering of fuel and the feeding of animals, this is provisions in these charters that allow for subsistence, that allow for survival. Now, obviously, none of us want to live in the 13th century. I'm not saying that the 13th century was in any way better than today. But, today, none of us are guaranteed subsistence, our basic survival. And those things that try and guarantee our basic survival are being actively attacked from all directions. Okay? So, don't listen to the powers of the day tell you to remember Magna Carta whilst they get rid of the Human Rights Act. But do remember Magna Carta as guaranteeing a traditional indigenous English right to the commons and to basic subsistence. That's what I think we can find in Magna Carta that is good and progressive, and not what we can't find in Magna Carta, which is the reactionary myth that is being celebrated today. Those are my thoughts.